is only believe. Only believe. If you can only believe what the Word of God says, some incredible things are going to happen. Amen? We see all through the Bible that uh, we are admonished. Uh, uh, Jairus was admonished by Jesus, and we'll look at that scripture here in a little while if we get that far. But he was admonished. He said, the Lord told him, he says, only believe. And his daughter had already passed away because the report came from the servants. But he told him, only believe. Are you willing to believe this morning? Are you willing to believe the word of God, that God's word is true? Amen. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this morning, you need to have a love for the Word of God. If you don't have a love already for the Word of God, you better get it. Because that is the foundation for believing the Word of God, loving it, keeping it, protecting it, and walking it out and allowing the Lord to work in your life. Amen. How many of y'all love the Word? How many brought your Bibles with you this morning? We're a church that believes in bringing you the, the Word. If you need one, you can raise your hand. we got plenty over there in the corner, and somebody will slip over there and get you one. Just lift your hand up, praise the Lord. I love the Word of God because I know it's true. Amen? Amen. Yeah, the Word of God says, let God be true and every man a liar. Yep. Man lies a lot, don't they? Oh, they tell us. They tell some stories. Father, we praise you and we thank you. I thank you for your mighty word, Lord God. I thank you, Father, for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you, Lord, that your word is true. And in the word of God, we find life. We find all the things that pertain unto life, joy, blessings in your word, Father God. And Lord, I ask this morning that you would just help us to open our hearts, open our minds to be able to receive the word with a heart of receiving in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. I want y'all to repeat this with me if you would. Say, Father, Father I, thank I thank you for your word. For your word. I receive it this morning. It. I'm going to believe it. I'm going to hear it. Amen. And I'm going to make a choice to believe it in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. When I made a choice to believe the word of God that I didn't have to die in my sins and go to hell, I got new life. And the Lord came in my heart right there, and he implanted his Holy Spirit within me. And I didn't know everything all at once. I still don't know everything. <laughs> Anybody here think you know it all? Come on. You know it all. <laughs> well, you don't. Praise the Lord. But you know what? We have the word. I've had many people tell me, said, you know, they'll ask me a question. Well, I don't know about that. But you know what? We've got the word of God. Let's go to the word. Let's see what the word of God says. Amen. So this morning, I want you to have your Bibles ready because we're going to get to some scripture here in a little bit. You can go ahead and turn to Luke 8 and just kind of hold right there because that's one of the scriptures I'm going to be reading here in a little bit. Luke 8. Wendy, good to see you this morning. Praise the Lord. Good to see the Dubniks. Hallelujah. Y'all taking up a good little section there. Glenda's with us this morning with who? Gunner? Gunner. Got Gunner with us this morning. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, and it's good to have you. Who is this? This is your mama. Mama, it's good to meet you. Glad you're here this morning with us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We had the Kellys drive in from Mountain Air. How long does it take you guys to get here? A couple hours? Is it short, though? Two and a half hours. Two hours for Tim. Two and a half for... <laughs> Two bathroom breaks. I get that. I was woke up this morning from a little... Some of y'all know we got a got a puppy. Man, that thing's getting big. It got big in the last two weeks I was gone. Yeah. And mama was still sleeping. And I knew that she had been here getting up every morning with that dog. I thought, I'm going to get up and take him out. And I took him out this morning, taking care of business. Hallelujah. <laughs> Only believe. Amen. What we believe is what moves us one way or the other. What we believe in our heart, in our mind, is going to move us one way or the other, okay? We all have been told things in our life that we believed, but they were not true. We've had true things spoken to us, and we've had untrue things spoken to us. Amen? We all agree to that, okay? And as a result, we respond to things in life based on that belief system that we've set into place. That's a foundation that we have set up and we respond when somebody says something or we have a situation in life, 
we respond from that because that is what we believe deep down inside. If you were told all your life growing up that a cat is a dog, and one day you hear someone say that a cat is a cat, you would possibly believe that they were wrong at first, would you not? More than likely, that would be all of our responses. Like, man, what's wrong with you? No, that's, that's a dog. Uh, you know, it's not a cat. <laughs> a cat is bigger than that. It's actually a dog. <laughs> or you would question what you had always been told. Some of us do that. And I want to tell you this morning that that is a good response. If somebody tells you something, it's okay to question that. And I'm going to tell you right here that in the word of God, this is your foundation for everything that you're being told uh, in this life. Uh, man has come up with so many things that they state that is true and they're not true. But your foundation is right here in the Word of God. And if you'll get this settled in your heart, you can respond from this platform right here. Amen. Exposure to the truth can be life changing if you respond. So many react, unfortunately. They'll hear the truth and they react. And what they're doing is reacting. It's a knee jerk reaction a lot of times in what their belief system has been that's not true. It's like, you know, spiritually rooted diseases. When's the first time you ever heard that a disease, how many of y'all think that disease comes from God? How many think, in here think that disease is God's intention for you? It's not. How many of you think the disease is just a bubble that's floating out there somewhere, and one day you might happen to walk into that bubble, and it just happened? Good. I'm glad y'all know y'all respond to that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We know that God's intentions for us are good, are they not? God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the cross to come and walk this earth and to show us the Father and to die, to go to the cross and die for our sins so that we can have what? Life. Now, that life, a lot of times we believe that, well, you know, this life ain't, ain't going too good. It ain't never going to go too good. I'm just going to continue to have issues and problems. And yes, you're going to have opportunities. We like to say that, don't we, in our household? It's an opportunity. You got an opportunity to make the right choice, to believe the right thing. Amen. But you're going to have things come across your plate. And it's up to you to understand where those things that are coming, where are they coming from? Come from the devil. Pastor, I used to sit under years ago. He always would say, good God, bad devil. <laughs> and I, was like, I like that. That's good. He is a good God, is he not? Is the devil good? No, he never was good. There was evil in his heart. And that's what the word of God says. He's, he's the father of lies. And so if he's a liar, he ain't going to ever tell you anything that's true. Amen. He might give you half truth but it's always going to be mixed with a lie. So exposure to the truth can be life-changing if you respond to that. Just hearing the truth is not a guarantee that you will change. Agree? There has to be a response on your end. Agree? You have to respond. A lot of us have grown up in the church. How many of y'all remember in the, the churches they used to have altars? I've pastored in churches that have had altars and stuff. And I'm going to tell you right here, we don't have that thing, but the altars are here. It's the pews, right? The, the pews. <laughs> it's the chairs you're sitting in. It's up here. It's on the floor. It doesn't matter. An altar is where you decide to drop and humble yourself before the Lord, submit to him, and get on your knees. Amen. And say, Lord, I'm tired of doing it my way. I want to do it your way. You know, they say that's a form of insanity, actually. When you keep doing something the same way over and over and expecting different results, but you never get it. That's a form of insanity, they say. When Jesus came to villages teaching, there was usually those that the word fell on good ground. And those that were not good ground. 
There also were those that received the word with great enthusiasm. At first, but it dried up and withered away, and even those that received, but because of the cares and the riches and the pleasures, there was no fruit to bring about and come into perfection. So in your word there in the Bible, in Luke 8, 15, the word of God says, and some of y'all know this story, it's talking about the word, the word sown is the seed, the seed is the word, amen. But that on good, the good ground are they. I want you to say with me this morning, Lord, I'm good ground. Look at your neighbor and say, you good ground? Come on, hallelujah. I want to be good ground, amen. Boy, everything in the word of God, I want, I want it all. I want everything that he has promised to me. Amen. Do you? But then on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word. Listen, you can't know until you hear, right? A few years, a couple of years ago, we started talking about who you are in Christ. How many of you know that you know that you know that what's on that wall based in that scripture reference, and it says, I am Christ's friend, I am welcome, I am holy, I am treasured, I'm forgiven, I am complete, I am clean. How many of you know that you know that you know that is who you are in Christ? Some of us are still working on it, though, and that's okay. The Word of God says, let patience have her perfect work. So many times we try to get the cart before the horse, and maybe we get things so out of order, and we struggle, and we struggle, we get frustrated, and things of that nature, when we're just not being patient with ourselves. It takes some time, folks. Has your heart, your inner man, has it been made alive unto Christ? How many of y'all have, have your inner man that's made, made alive unto Christ, your spirit man? Come on. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then that has changed. That is alive in you right now. And you can hear the Holy Spirit when he speaks to you. Amen. Many people, or let me finish this, the, the word, it says, having heard the word, that is key. And then it says, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. I'm going to tell you this morning, be patient with yourselves. Man, sometimes we're just so hard on ourselves, are we not? Sometimes we're, we're, we're our worst enemy in the, in the respect that we listen to the enemy and kick ourselves because we have fallen and we've fallen and we keep struggling with things. I'm going to tell you, there's hope this morning. There's hope because Jesus Christ went to the cross and died. And Galatians 5.1 says, it is for freedom that Christ hath what? Set you free. How many of you know that the word of God says that, that Christ went to the cross, he died for you, he set you free, that you're free? Now, are you struggling with things? I would, I would put out there to you that if you're struggling with things, it's because you've not taken hold of who you are in Christ. Come on. And bring forth fruit with patience. Many struggle with hearing that they are doing nothing for the kingdom because they have no freedom, freedom, uh, fruit. I had someone years ago, some, uh, someone Sandy and I were ministering to, and we were sitting and talking with them like, well, I have no fruit in my life. And what they were doing is basing their fruit on, I have no converts. I have no people that I've actually told about Jesus, and they've given their life to the Lord. And I was like, that's, that's not it. That's not what it's about. Yes, we're to be about kingdom business, but you can't be about kingdom business unless you deal with what's going on inside of your heart first. And I believe this scripture here, what it's talking about is the fruit in your life. If you'll get the fruit in your life right, and, and, and knowing who you are and dealing with your own stuff, then all that other stuff will just fall into place. That just happens. Many struggle with hearing that they are doing nothing for the kingdom because they have no fruit. They correlate fruit with converts that they have won over because of their testimony. Listen, there have been many people that, yes, I have shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've been able to minister to them the truth and the Holy Ghost is working in their hearts and they've given their lives to the Lord and they go on and they continue to grow in the Lord. But there's been many people that I've ministered to, I've witnessed to, and they've told me, oh, I just have no, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Some of y'all have experienced that too. And I don't just fall into a puddle and go, oh my goodness. No, I just, I go on, I go to the next one. 
But I keep praying for that individual. And I, I, I've seen people that I've ministered to over the years. It's like, nope. A year or two later, five years, ten years later, you hear they're serving the Lord. What you speak in truth, it's going to penetrate the heart, folks. You may not see You may not even see it in your lifetime. But speak the truth anyway. Amen? That's what he calls us to do. If it were the case that, that the fruit is coming from converts and seeing God working in other people's lives because of things that we're doing, if that were the case, then our fruit is based on others. Come on. Then our fruit is based on others. And I'm going to tell you this morning, that'll be a very frustrating experience. How many of y'all deal with frustrations? Come on. How many get frustrated? Come on. Tell the truth. How many of you get frustrated? Come on. How many of you get frustrated with others? Come on. How many of you get frustrated with yourself? <laughs> blocked goals, listen to me now, blocked goals by others, blocked goals by others brings forth the fruit of frustration. I'm going to tell you, do not set goals that others can come in and knock down. You're putting expectations on others that are not a reality. If you find yourself constantly frustrated that you have placed expectations that are not reality on others or possibly even on yourself. You need to take that to heart. Certainly all this morning need to hear that. Remember we talked to those of you that have been through Freedom in Christ. We talked about life goals and things like that. You know, as a pastor, yeah, it's, it's a great thing that oh, I want to reach the whole community here on this mountain. My goal is I'm going to get everybody saved on this mountain, and we're going to be a holy city under the Lord. There won't be a sinner one in this mountain. They're all going to be saved. Am I setting myself up to get frustrated? You betcha. Because you know what? There's going to be those that believe and those that don't believe. And if I base my performance, if I base my success on something somebody else has got to make a choice to do, you can you can for sure bet that I'm going to be a frustrated person. I expect the person in front of me to drive right, obey all the rules and laws of man, stop for every stoplight, go through every green light, drive the speed limit, or drive over the speed limit that I'm driving. Oh, come on. I put expectations on other people that I'm going to get frustrated. Listen. Frustration can be eliminated if you put no expectations on others. It's just cream on the crop, man. I love the days. Glory to God, man. I love the days that I hit every green light. I mean, you had days like that. It's like, woo, glory. Pull in the wall by, woo, cut the parking place up. I always look for the parking place up front. I probably need to walk more, though. <laughs> Sometimes I get that parking place up front. And I'm like, woo, yeah, you know. Or I find the line that's not really got anybody in it, maybe one person. And I'm thinking, man, I'm going to get out of here quick. No, that person has an issue. And the next thing you know, they've called another person to come over and help. Before you know it, they got three or four people over there trying to figure that thing out. And you're looking over here to the line to the left. It's like, I could have been behind that person that's already gone. Yeah. The story in Luke is about the word in our own hearts, bringing forth fruit within ourselves. These individuals that brought forth fruit started with an honest and good heart. They heard the word, they kept the word, and the result was fruit with patience. I think a prayer we should always pray for ourselves if we see ourselves struggling to receive the word and keeping it is, Father God, I'm asking you that you would show me what needs to be done in me to be good ground. And I believe ultimately that we are good ground, folks, because in order to be good ground, you had to receive the word in the first place. And the word is still there, the word of salvation that has saved your soul. Amen. So let's say that again. Let's say this together. Say, I'm good ground because I believed on Jesus. And I'm still believing on Jesus. Look at your neighbor and say, You're good ground. 
You're good ground. You're good ground, folks. Sometimes we think, boy, I'm just a terrible. No, you're not. God loves you, man. Come on. He loves you so much. So that I can see your word and take hold and then grow in me and bring forth the fruit you desire for me to have. That You know, that's one of the things that we need to desire the things that God desires for us. I believe that if we come into agreement with God and we desire those things, number one, I believe that he gives us the desires of our heart. A lot of people say, whoa, man, I'm desiring a brand new truck, car, or whatever, brand new house. Well, that may not be for you. I don't know. I can't, I can't answer that. But I believe that God puts the desires in our hearts so that we'll long after the things that are right, that are righteous. And he, when, and when those things come in, into our heart, he put them there, then we can just come into agreement with him and they just naturally come. Amen. The word keep, I love that word keep. It reminds me of back in castle days, uh, the word the keep. How many of y'all know what the keep was? What was it? It was the, the, the tower that, that took yes. them all. It was the tower. The yes. It was that safe place that they would, when, when things were going on, somebody blow a horn, ring a bell, or fire, whatever. Back in those days, they didn't have guns. But it was an alert system to say, you better get over the keep. Because it was a tower, it was a stronghold. Listen, God is your stronghold. He's the one that you need to stay in, amen? I believe we need to stay there in the keep. But it says that, that the word keep is a verb, and it shows something we are doing in order to retain it. Keep his word. Yes, it's something you do. Now, it's not something you do to earn salvation, but it's something you do to retain the joy of the Lord. You got to keep a hold of the word, amen? You got to be in the word in order, number one, to walk in the word, amen? Man, we got the word abundantly today, don't we? How many of you have more than one Bible? How many of you have more than two Bibles? How many of you have more than three Bibles? Come on, yeah, hallelujah. Four Bibles. Five, six, seven. Man, I don't even know how many. I, I got like probably. I think we have about 20. I have about 20 Bibles. Hey, if I count those ones over there on the corner. <laughs> That's a lot of Bibles. It's abundant. The word of God is abundant, but it's scarcely spoken and walked in today. How many of you ever planted a garden in your life? How many of y'all love gardens? Any of y'all getting ready for a spring garden? Yeah. How many of y'all did a, a, a fall or winter garden? Man, we're having to learn this climate up here. We were looking at stuff and trying to figure it out. And finally, we decided, you know what? Let's just grow some garden inside. And Sandy got a system. One of the kids bought her for Christmas. And then one of the other kids is buying a grow light. Yeah, Pastor and Pastor's wife is going to have some grow lights in the church. Hallelujah. <laughs> But we're gonna be growing tomatoes. We're gonna to grow some tomatoes. Yeah, we're gonna call. We're gonna grow some jalapenos. I don't know what else. We're gonna grow some stuff. Yeah, we ain't growing any of that other weird stuff. What did it take to start the process of that garden? Plan. Who said? Plan. Yeah, that's right. Plan. Number one, you need to plan on where you're gonna put it. Right. You can put it on the side of the house and never get sun. Would that garden prosper? Mm -hmm. No. Huh? Well, that's true. I mean, some plants don't need a whole lot. They need filter some, you know. Number two, what did it take to maintain it? A little bit, a little bit of water, a little bit of work, a lot of work. A fence, it's good, yes, to keep the varmints out from eating it. A commitment, I like that, a commitment. So if you planned it, then you need to maintain it. 
And that commitment is going out there and laying your eyes on that garden at a fair minimum of once, maybe twice, three, four times a day. Going into that garden, there's things that need to be done in a garden, or they're not. Some of us learn that. Hallelujah. You got weeds you got to pull. You got rabbits you got to shoot. You can eat those too. Amen. Yeah, that makes, hey, the garden is a magnet for varmints that you can eat. Hallelujah. Come on, Clyde. Come on. You got to maintain it. There's things that you got to do in order to get it to that place that you want. Listen, you don't plant a garden expecting, well, I'm going to get some carrots about like this big. I'm just, you know. No, you have a picture of what that garden is going to look like. And sometimes our gardens don't look like that. I get that. Tomatoes this big. I'm thinking of tomato that big. You know? But you got to do something. You got to get out there and maintain it. You got to pull the weeds. You got to water. You got to fertilize. There's different things you got to do. And then the end result is what? The harvest. The harvest. That I love the harvest. You got the work. Man, that's hard stuff. But the harvest is your reward, is it not? God's faithful. Listen, folks, he's faithful. He will continue to maintain and harvest what he's begun in you. That's the truth. But you've got to be willing to be in the Word of God. You've got to be willing to, when, when you realize that there's an area in your life that's like, man, i got some pretty hard, crusted over soil there, apparently. The Word says this, but I'm not seeing this in my life. I'm not experiencing this. Then you need to be able to go in and till that area, get some good organic fertilizer and till it in there and work that area. Your heart is up to you to receive of the word and get that ground right. That is your responsibility, folks. Philippians 1 6, you can turn there. Philippians 1 6, it says, being confident. I love that word confident. How many of you are confident people in here? How many of you are confident in the word of God? that God's word will do. It will hit its mark. It won't return void, but it will go forth. It will accomplish what it's been set forth to do. How many of how many you believe that? Come on. It says being confident of this very thing that he, who, who is he? God. He, that which hath begun a good work, because it's good work, Look at your neighbor and say, it's a good work he started to do. You can say he's got a little ways to go still. <laughs> Will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We know that's the return of the Lord. Amen. I'm so ready for that. But I'm so happy that the Lord, he ain't given up on me. Man, I've had people give up on me in the past. and say, forget that guy. You know, you ever experienced that? Forget it. But I've had people that have not given up on me. Listen, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for a lady over in Lamb Passes, Texas, praise the Lord, by the name of Jolene McCord, that didn't give up on John Taylor. I wouldn't be here. But she just held on. She has the tenacity, some of y'all know, the tenacity of a little, I don't know, you call it a bulldog or a chihuahua. Chihuahuas is Man, they just won't let go. You try to shake them off, and man, they just cling on, you know, they're like, my word, praise God. But God has started to work in you, and you're good ground, but there are areas in your heart that need to be softened up so that you can receive more. How many of you want more? How many of you are blessed? Come on in, Jesus. <laughs> I was preaching in uh, Staples, Texas, and the church we passed. We pastored that church for about five years. And uh, man, it was a Holy Ghost moment. Some of y'all know I get excited when I'm preaching the word, word of the Lord. And I'm just, man, I'm just going, I don't even remember what I was saying, but but I, I just, in the name of Jesus, and I'm just up there, and I did this number. And the back doors on the sanctuary fell off their hinges and hit the floor and slid down the cathedral stairs. 
And I was like, whoa, man. <laughs> uh, but as they were falling, I'm like, Lord, I hope there's nobody coming up them stairs because it's going to mess them up. A couple of the brothers went over there like, wow, we're, and those are big doors. They were like 10 feet tall. or up. They were solid wood doors. They were longleaf pine. That's what they were. Hey, how many, how many, how many of the men went to the uh, men's conference up on the mountain? One, two, how many have I got in here? Two of you. Yeah, Jeff, y'all went too. You went too. Very good. Do you guys remember when we started the teaching on the Holy Spirit? What happened? A dove flew and landed. I'm standing here and a dove flew in and landed right over there. Jeff, it was right in front of you. I was like, man, I've never had that happen before. Preaching on the Holy Ghost, man. I was like, oh, that's so cool. I just stopped. I'm like, is that what is that? You know, I think you said that's done. Somebody says it. I'm like, whoa. I told Jolene a few days later, I said, You won't believe what happened. And I told her, and she said, Oh, I've always wanted to have that happen. <laughs> and I'm like, Well, usually when we're inside, we're teaching, we're inside, the doors are closed. <laughs> He'd open some windows, you know, and hoping she wouldn't go into envy and jealousy. She didn't. So. <laughs> Oh, uh, how, how many of y'all know that God's faithful? Yeah. You know, the word of God says that he's faithful. And it says, even if our heart condemns us, he's still what? Faithful. That's so beautiful. I, th that is such a comforting scripture to me that even when I've listened to the enemy and I've condemned myself and I've just torn myself down, I, I can't believe that I got mad. I did this, I did that. And I'm beating myself up, self up, you know. But God says, you know what? I'm still faithful. Why? Because it's not based on me. It ain't based on. It's based on Jesus, his son. His faithfulness is based on that. Amen. And was he faithful? Jesus faithful? Sure he was. How many of y'all know who Dirk Prince was? He was a mighty man of the Lord. Incredible. Um, preached the word. Great authority. He's with the Lord now. Praise God. I've learned a lot from the man over the years. Never got to see him in person, but I, I watched a lot, listened a lot on YouTubes and things of that nature, read many of his books. But Derek Prince tells a story about a young man that was told as a kid that their donkey that they had was a zebra. And as Derek Prince would pronounce zebra, he would say zebra. He would say zebra. Some of y'all may have heard this story. Why he was told it was a zebra, I don't know. It may be something with the butter snake. But years ago, we told our kids, stay out of that. There's a butter snake in there. And uh, they wouldn't get in there anymore. It was some plants we planted. And come to find out, there really was a butter snake. <laughs> they came to us and said, you know, there's an actual, when they got older, they started, hey, remember that butter snake that lived in there? And they started looking it up. And they, yeah, there's a butter snake. No idea. <laughs> Yeah, they caught daddy on that one. So, But for whatever reason, I, I, I don't know. But it wasn't until this young man, I think it was, he went to Africa or something like that. And they have zebras or zebras over there. And he started seeing these animals look like horses that had uh, black stripes on white bodies or white stripes on black bodies. I don't know which one it is. It's one of the, either way, they got black and white stripes. Underbelly's white, okay. So they're white with black stripes. There you go. So, huh? Monochromatic. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But he started calling donkeys. People were like, what's wrong with you? And everybody would responded that those are zebras. And after a while, the young man had to take notice that everybody over here is calling these things zebras, except for me. And he had to acknowledge that something was not quite right there, okay? And eventually he accepted that those things were named zebras and he accepted that truth and rejected the other and stopped calling them donkeys, but called them zebras or zebras. Belief is what you accept to be true. Come on. Belief is what you accept to be true. It's what you're believing. I think you, you talked about that last Sunday. 
believing, your desire, your will, and things of that nature. What, what you believe sets the framework for your response. And I want you to turn over to Acts chapter 8 with me. Acts chapter 8. <clears throat> We're going to read this story here. What you believe sets the framework for your response. And I want to begin in uh, verse 5. Some of y'all know this story. It says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. He preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Do you think it brings joy when people get healed and people get set free? Amen. One of our scriptures for, what is it, Luke 4.18? Uh, for our church is setting captives free. It talks about the spirit of the Lord being upon us also over in Isaiah. That's our scripture for the church the Lord gave us many, many years ago. That our purpose is, number one, get ourselves set free, hallelujah, because Jesus has set us free so that you can set others free, amen? Are you setting others free? Are you helping them get free? Are you speaking truth? And it says, and there was great joy in that city, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is, a great, is the great power of God. And to him they had regard because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. <clears throat> then Simon himself believed also. A sorcerer. He believed. Believed what? Believed the truth. That was the beginning of his journey, was it not? Simon himself believed also. When he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now, when the apostles which were in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. I love this part. Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Oh, glory to God. Had they believed? What kind of, what are we talking about here? If they believed, why didn't they have the Holy Ghost? Huh? Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them. He was fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, water baptized. That's the baptism of the Holy Ghost right there. Two separate events. We believe a lot of times people... You, I believe, you know, when I baptize people, I'll have somebody, you know, at our church, we, we, we would do an altar call and people come forward, people give their life to the Lord. We drag out, I get somebody down there, we drag out the baptismal, we get it filled up and what have you. And I, we baptize them that Sunday or sometimes the next Sunday. And I pray also for them, number one, the baptism, because, we, you know, it's a water baptism, but I would pray also for them to receive the Holy Ghost at the same time. That is a beautiful thing to see that all at once occur. I've had people that I've baptized, they've come up speaking in the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, prophesying, coming right up out of the water, man, and their mouths, and it, it just won't stop because they've yielded the Lord, man. It's incredible. This next verse in 18, the reason I read you this, or reading you this story, is I want you to understand, I want you to get into Simon's head here a little bit, okay? I want you to kind of get a little bit of a picture of where Simon is responding from. Remember, Simon was a sorcerer, okay? 
And I, I've heard preachers over the years just bash Simon and stuff. Yeah, he was wrong, what he was saying. And the Word of God even gives that account. Peter rebukes him, okay? It says, and when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. <laughs> he offered them money. He offered them money so that he could get this power so he could do the same thing. Was his heart right there? No, it was not. But what I want you to see is that, number one, he was responding from what his belief system was before. It was an error. Had he gotten everything just totally downloaded that day when, when he believed? No. He had a ways to go. And this is just insight into Simon that he needed to hang out with Philip a little bit longer and Peter you know, and, and all those guys so he could learn. And it goes on and says, saying, give me also this power that whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee. It's not about money. That's the furthest thing it's about. Thy money perish with thee because thou hast, hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. The gift of God was purchased at the cross over 2,000 years ago. Already been purchased. There's nothing you can do other than saying, I'll take that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for dying for my sins on the cross. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. And what he's saying is, uh, no, nah, this, this is not your time, buddy. No, you have no part in this. He wasn't saying that you're not a Christian and you need to just leave and this and that. No, he's saying you, you need to repent because it's not about the money. It's not about a power trip. It's not about all those things. It's about our heart condition before the Lord. And he says in 22, repent therefore of, of this, thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon, and I believe this was his form of repentance and saying, no, 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 no I want to know. I want to understand. He says, then answered Simon Peter and said, pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. We respond even to the word of God based on things that we've heard and things we've learned in our growing up. The first time that you heard but the gospel of Jesus Christ, some of you may have said, you know what, I'll just think about that for a while. Some of us, or you, said yes. But there are those, because of the things they've heard, listen, you can't even receive God's Holy Spirit unless the Holy Spirit's already dealing with you, number one. It's not a man thing. It's all about God and you receiving it. The only way to start the process of changing our wills, and I'm going to tag in on some things that Sandy was speaking to you last Sunday. How many of you, you know that your will is what you're believing right now in the moment, right? Come on. It's what you're believing right now in the moment, and it's your response. It's how you do things. It's what you do. How in the world do we get our wills to line up with God's will? Know the word. Know the word. But if you know the word, why isn't your will lining up with the word of God? Surrender. Believe it. Renewing our minds. That's what I'm looking for right there. The renewal of the mind. Sandy mentioned last Sunday stronghold busters. How many of y'all have done stronghold busters in the past? Man, I tell you what, I, I listened to her message and I watched her message. I told her, I said, honey, I watched your message because I wanted to see you. <laughs> and I listened to it and watched my honey giving that message. I said, you inspired me to make up another stronghold buster. I said, that was powerful, praise God. And start getting my mind renewed in even more areas, praise the Lord. But the renewal of the mind, listen, that's our battle. Look at your neighbor and say, the battle's in the mind. That's the truth. The only way to start the process of changing our wills in alignment 
with truth is number one, and I've got, uh, let's see, I think five things here for you. Yeah, I got five things I want to give you. Number one, and this is based on Luke 8, 15. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Are you going to be perfect? No. no. Anybody in here perfect? I'm putting my hand down. Pull that hand down. I'm not perfect. Number one, be honest with ourselves, with others, and with God. Be honest. Be honest with ourselves, God and others. Honestly, honesty is the first place because it is what we call recognizing. Recognizing we have an issue. And the way we've been approaching it is not working to make it better. How many of you just, you got is you may have a disease or something like that, or you got some stuff going on, and you just keep going after it the same way, and it doesn't change. We were talking with Glenda and Toby yesterday. We were at their house visiting. And we got to talking about going after that spiritual kingdom. And I told them, I said, well, if you're going, you believe, number one, the word, and you're going after the, that spiritual kingdom, and you ain't seeing any change or whatever, then that's not the right spirit to go after. Because they got to respond in the name of Jesus, don't they? Yeah. So if you're not getting a response and you're not seeing anything change, move on. Ask the Lord, okay, Lord, reveal it. A lot of times, man, I get to a place, I'm like, man, I don't even know where else to go from here, but God, you do. I tell the Lord that, and I start praying in the Holy Ghost. The next thing I know, the Lord showed me something, or he's spoken to my heart something. And I'll mention it to or, or, or Sandy Will, or whoever's with us on the ministry chain, ministry somebody, and say, I just, I'm feeling like, or I'm hearing, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, whoosh, that was the breakthrough. That's why it's important to pray in the Holy Ghost, man. How many pray in the Holy Ghost every day? You need to be praying in the Holy Ghost every day, folks. Praying in the Spirit, it's important. Honesty is the first place because it is recognizing we have an issue and the way we have been approaching it is not working to make it any better. How about I'll just do better the next time? How many of you ever said that? Man, I've said it a lot. Well, I'll just try and do better the next time. What is that? Willpower. Self-will, willpower. How many of you think willpower is the key? Yes, sir. Man, there's a lot of stupid books out there by the world. There was a book called People Skills. I forget the guy's name. Somebody gave me it one time. I don't know what this is all about. And I read a little bit of it, and I was like, oh, this is about manipulating others through the trash. But it was also about willpower, that you can do anything if you got enough willpower. I'm going to tell you, folks, it's about God's will. That's what it's about. Doing, submitting, humbling yourself before the Lord. That's what it's about. So number one is be honest with ourselves with God and others. Number two, be good ground. Be good ground. How many of you want to be good ground? How many of you are good ground? Come on. I think we all are good ground. If we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are good ground. But there are areas, like I've said, that need to be cultivated. Wherever there's struggles, that's area that needs to be cultivated. Amen? In the verse in Luke 8, there are two words in the verse that are the word good. Okay, let me read that scripture again. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. The first word good means beautiful. Beautiful. It reminds me of that song we just sang. Beauty, glory, glory, glory. He's beautiful. He looks at you as beautiful too, though. Did you know that? Some of us have faced ourselves square in the mirror before and just really torn ourselves down. How many of y'all have done that? Come on. Man, I have. 
Then I spoke of stuff that I've had to cancel out later, some more incursions and things like that. But in the mirror, you are so beautiful that to your Lord Jesus Christ that he went to the cross for you. The second good word means agreeable. So they're two totally different words. In the English, you read it and you think, huh, good, good, it's the same. No, it's not. They're two, two totally different words. But that second one means agreeable. Agreeable. That tells me in order to have a good heart, we must be in agreement with God in his word, whatever he says. If we're not in agreement, then we are in the opposite, which is what? Disagreement. I believe that God wants our lives to be at ease. When you put dis in front of ease, what do you get? Disease. Because it's a dis-easing of life. So if we're not in agreement, we're in a disagreement. That tells me in order to have a good heart, we must be in agreement with God's word. With whatever he says. If we're not in agreement, then we're in disagreement. The only way to be in agreement with God is to mix our belief with the faith he has already given to us. It's about faith. He's given every one of us the measure of faith. Acts 28, 24 through 29, you can turn there. Acts 28, 24 through 29, it says, and some believe the things which were spoken and some believe not. So there's going to be those that believe, even here in this congregation, I would hope as your pastor that you would believe every word of God that I'm speaking to you this morning. The things that are of the Lord, believe them. Only believe. I would hope, and that is my prayer for you this morning, it was last night that you would believe the word of God this morning. Take it to heart. Let the seed get in there. Let it get below the surface. Let it start sprouting and let it start growing up and let it start bringing fruit. Hallelujah. That is my prayer for you guys. But even in this congregation, there may be some of you that just say, no, nah, I don't believe that. That's your choice. And it's not my fault. Some believe the things which are spoken and some believe not. When they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. It says, well, spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah, the prophet unto our fathers, saying, go unto this people. And say, hearing ye shall hear and shall understand. And seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart. It should be converted, that's a key word there, converted, and I should heal them. We talked about that scripture, Cindy, oh, about a year or so ago. I'm like, what in the world does that mean? Sounds like God's not wanting to come them to be healed. No, he wants them to be healed. What it means is I will heal them if they will just submit to me and allow me to do the work that needs to be done in their heart. But you got to be converted. And to be converted is to believe the word of God. Take it for face value that it says what it says. Even if you're not experiencing it, believe it for what it says. Glory to God. Because God's word is true and every man is a liar. That's the truth. Be it known, therefore, unto you that the salvation of God is sent in Charles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. Agreement with God's word is critical if we're going to see the fruit of it in our hearts. I've had things in God's word that I just didn't get, but I made the choice to believe it anyway. Because he said it. So many times I see saints trying to stand for something and just give in within a day. Or maybe an hour. I've seen some give in within 30 seconds. Speaking out of both sides of their mouth. That's that. That's double-mindedness. But. The word but is one of the biggest. It's the biggest but out there. <laughs> I don't like that word. God's word says, but that's not what I'm experiencing. God's word says, but that's unbelief. 
That's not believe, that's that's making a choice to not believe what God's word says. It's because they just didn't make the choice to stand no matter what. Number three, have ears to hear. Have ears to hear. This means to attend to. It means to attend to. It means consider what is or has been said. And, and I, I pray that, number one, you're attending to these words, but that when you leave from here, that you will consider what has been said this morning you will talk to the Lord about it and say, Lord, I need to know what you're wanting me to get from this message today. What do you want me to hear? What do you want me to understand? What do you want me to take heart to? What do you want me to respond to? What do you want me to do with this? Sometimes when people speak to me, I hear them, but I didn't understand them. I didn't understand what they said, and I'll ask them to repeat what they said because I want to engage them from a place of understanding, from a place of where they're coming from. I've had to ask people in the past to tell me again several times because I just didn't get it. I was like, I don't know what you're saying here. Not even told people, you know what, can you phrase that in a different way because I want to understand where you're coming from because I want to respond intelligently to what you're saying. So many times somebody will say something and we just, oh yeah, okay, you know, and you just go on. You don't even know what they said. I've been talking with people before thinking I'm having a two-way conversation and I'll stop talking and they take over and the next thing you know, it's all about me. <laughs> Remember that song? <laughs> That's a form of self-pity. That's an unloving spirit that's there because it continually takes it back. Or it could be the total opposite of that and totally put it all on you because they don't want you to see what's going on in their hearts. So number three is have ears to hear, folks. Have ears to hear. Number four, keep the word. We talked about the word keep. This means to guard it with all your being. Hide it in your heart. You can be guaranteed that even right now, the enemy is doing his best to wage a war in your heart to try to take what's being spoken to you. Look at your neighbor and say, don't let the enemy take this word. How many of you love a sound mind? Man, I love a sound mind. I didn't used to have a sound mind. God said I did, and I just didn't claim it. I didn't walk in it. Man, I struggled. I struggled with so many things. Boy, I used to jump and leap and go and do. Gotten to the point where I've just slowed down a little bit. And that's okay. It's all right. It's okay. Praise God. So you can be guaranteed the enemy is trying to steal it right now because he doesn't want the fruit to bring forth in your life, folks. He doesn't want that. <clears throat> Protecting the word means that the word must be precious to us in the first place. You protect something that's precious to you, something that you love. You guard it. And you keep it, you keep it safe and you say, you know what? I ain't letting nothing get to this. It's going to have to take me out before I'll, I'll let it get to that, get, get to one of my family members, do this or do that. You guard it with your life. You need to have the same perspective when it comes to the word of God. Man, I love this word. And I'll tell you what, I've had righteous anger dwell up in me many times in the past. And I'm like, oh my goodness, Lord, what in the world's going on? There's the Holy Ghost come on because some, somebody was going after, it was a spirit in somebody going after the word to tear the word down. And I can't stand that more than anything, folks. The truth must be spoken. I love the word of God. How many of you love the word? How many of you would die for the word? Put me all in. Because I know what's after this life. Yeah, praise God we're in America. There are people today dying for the word of God all over this world. must be precious to you in the first place. The enemy is so adamant to try and 
and change God's words and water them down with worldly ideology. We see it in songs. We see it in movies. We hear it in conversations. And some of us even experience it in churches. Not good. Watering the word down is not good. The individuals who do that will give an account for one day. In Isaiah 50, verse 7, it says, For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you this morning, if you'll stand on the Word of God, if you'll set your face like a flint when it comes to the Word of God, there will be no shame. None whatsoever. I believe here in Isaiah, the point to take to heart is to know that you know that you know that you know. And you don't turn to the left and you don't turn to the right, folks. You stay the course like a ship heading into the wind. When the winds are raging out on the waters, on the seas and the ships, what do they do? Their course may be this way, but when the winds come, <clears throat> they have to turn that ship and go into the wind for a while. I love the, old, uh, the movie. It's got Russell Crowe in it. <clears throat> I don't recommend all of Russell Crowe's movies, but Master and Commander, how many of y'all seen that? Man, I can watch that over and over. There's so much that I can learn from that just in the old uh, ways they did things, you know? It's actually a pretty clean movie, except for the violence. <laughs> pretty violent. Stay the course like a ship heading into the wind. When you do not love the word, you will allow the word to be perverted. Compromise comes in when we do not already have a conviction in our hearts to keep God's word. Many make keeping the word a religious thing. They whitewash the outside, but they never allow the inside to be clean. Something that you love, you will keep. So that one was keeping the word. Number five, and I'm going to finish up with this one here. Bringing forth fruit is just the process of the condition of the heart. It occurs naturally because of understanding. It comes from a place of understanding. Here it is. Right there. You understand this, you should get a hold of this. Fruit will just naturally start coming forth. How many of you are experiencing fruit because you've started believing this? You've started speaking this. That, that when the enemy tells you, no, you're rejected, you say, no, 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 no. It says over here in Ephesians 1 4, I'm, man, I'm chosen. If I'm chosen, I can't be rejected. How many, you know, it, Christ doesn't love you, but the word of God says that I'm Christ's friend. I'm God's child. Your salvation is not secure. Now he says, I'm sealed. That shuts him up. I'm sealed, glory to God. I belong to my Father in heaven. You're not forgiven. How many of you hear that? How many of you have done something and you won't forgive yourself, but the word of God says you're already forgiven? You just need to appropriate it, glory to God. Is there anything in here other, other than blaspheming the Holy Ghost, that you can't be forgiven of. No. No. no, sir. Jesus Christ died and paid the price so that you could be forgiven. I'm safe. These three things around in Christ, this is who we are. That's what, that's what, that's what the enemy stole, man. He stole the significance, the security, and the acceptance. But if you get a hold of this, then what starts happening is fruit just starts boop, popping out. You start having fruit because you're walking in agreement with God's word. And it just naturally happens. And then out of that, be impatient with yourself also, others start noticing. My son told me in Texas, he said, man, dad, he said, a lot of the stuff that before I left, he says, a lot of the stuff that you face down here, and I'm not trying to toot my horn or anything. But I'm secure in my Lord. He said, a lot of those things, man, you would have lost it. You're just missing that. I thought, thank you, Jesus. He says, I'm proud of you, Daddy. Man, that just, 
man, right there, I'm proud of you, Dad, because you've taken hold of that. So bringing forth fruit, it's just a process of Amen. Getting a hold of it. That last word mentioned in there is patience. Many want to see the results in just a few minutes. Man, we have a we've become a society of microwaves, folks. Microwaves. We're microwaves in motion. <laughs> you know? Microwave, we, we just want to see the results. We want it to happen so quickly. We want it now. And we're not going to wait for it. I believe that's a design of the devil. Not being patient can bring in so many things that are ungodly, even occult practices, and even some witchcraft. I've seen that many times. And a whole list of other things. We need to be patient with ourselves. Be patient with yourself. God is. Tell yourself, I'm going to be patient with myself. Because God started the work. And he ain't giving up on me. 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 Is he giving up on you? No. 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 Not at all. Not at all. Glory to God. Would you stand with me, please? I mean, you were saved. You didn't just get a download like a computer, did you? If you did, I'd like to know about it. <laughs> no. Uh -uh. But you are getting a download, folks, if you'll stay plugged in. Come on. If you stay plugged in, the download will be, it'll just keep on going. Hallelujah. I see so many saints struggling in their walk with the Lord because they have not, they've not been discipled. They've not stayed plugged in, man. Go from one thing to the next. They're like, oh, I just, maybe, maybe this one's it. Maybe this one's it. Maybe this new fad is it. Maybe this new uh, conference is it. Maybe this new evangelist coming to town is it. Maybe this new diet is it. How many of y'all have taken on a new diet for the new year? <laughs> Maybe this is it. Maybe that's it. I'm going to tell you right here, this is it. This is it because it's God's mighty and it's his holy word. That's the truth. Maybe the next drug. And it's all in hopes that it will be the answer to set them free. Set them free from their frustrations. Listen, I've given you the key to not be frustrated this morning if you'll receive it. Come on. The key to not being afraid. I mean, y'all got a lot this morning. Did you stay plugged in? <laughs> Come on. The key to discovering why you have a disease even. Relationship failures. Why that comes about? Hopelessness is real. If you don't experience freedom, that's the road you're on. Feeling hopeless. I'm here to tell you, you don't have to be hopeless. Because God's word is powerful, even though the pulling down of strongholds, folks. It is the strongholds that keep us from getting our minds renewed. Getting our minds renewed, amen? You said it. The renewal of the mind. That's the key. This is the key. This is a renewing of the mind. It's a process in that respect. God says you got it right now, folks. It's good to go to conferences. And of course, I promote heart of forgiveness because I got a lot of freedom there because I made a choice to believe the truth that was being spoken to me. But I'm going to tell you, if you, you go to the next conference, you go to this and that, and you don't make a choice to believe, in a year from now, you're going to be in the same condition you are now, if not worse. Make a choice to believe. 
Too many are captives to the way the enemy wants them to think because they have an identity crisis and they don't even know who they are or what to do. Our response needs to be from that platform right there, based in the word of God. If you're struggling with something, listen. The word of God is the answer. That is the only answer. Everything else has failed me. Everything else has failed me. My God has never failed me. Hey, would y'all come? You have a song to play? Come from a, I, I'm just, man, I'm sensing in my spirit this morning that some of you still got unforgiveness in your heart. Man, and, and I've learned that unforgiveness is the big one. Because unforgiveness blocks the next thing that God wants to do in your heart because he wants you to forgive because he has forgiven you. Some of you may be having unforgiveness. Man, some of you might have gotten unforgiveness over the holidays. I don't know. <laughs> they didn't cook what I wanted them to cook. Who knows, man? It's crazy the stupid stuff we listen to, ain't it? And we get in a place of, of, of taking an offense. But I'm going to tell you, if you're Christ, my Christ, Walked to the cross, carried that cross to the cross, that big uh, cross beam, and bled for you so that you could be forgiven, then you need to forgive yourself. And you need to start today and say, today is a new day. I'm going to stop walking in the woulda, shoulda, couldas. I'm going to stop walking in the past. I'm going to quit listening to the devil. But when I do listen to him, because I probably will at some point, I'm going to take responsibility. I'm going to recognize and I'm going to deal with it. Amen. So as they play this song, my prayer right now in the mighty name of Jesus is for every one of you dear saints. I know you're good ground. Glory to God, you're good ground. I pray in Jesus name that his word has already penetrated your heart and you're going to right now in Jesus name forgive and you're going to move on. Amen. And let the past be the past. Glory to God. Amen? Amen. Do you receive the word? I receive the word. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If any of y'all need to come forward, these chairs. If you need me to pray with you and believe, here I'm, I'm here. That's what I'm, I'm pastor supposed to do. I'm here to believe with you and mix my faith with you.